And it gets pretty weird. I mean, yeah, you get people walking, you get people running, you get people throwing things, you get people walking upstairs, walking upstairs. Um, then he starts getting into like nude women picking up babies and tossing water over their shoulders and stuff like that. Really worth looking at. Moybridge. And actually, he was crazy. He was documented he was crazy. He got in a stagecoach accident, got a head injury in the 1860s, I think. And he started changing his name. His given name was Edward, spelled normally. But he started changing it to Edward. Okay. Um, so modern photography is, is, is born with the um, fast shutter and a sort of crisp print that Moybridge is doing. But even into the early 1900s, people are still practicing this sort of soft, pictorialist style. You see this soft, sort of hazy, I mean, yeah, we're looking at a carriage in the snow on Fifth Avenue in the collision of 1888. Or we're looking at the Flatiron Building in the snow. Um, both classic, beautiful photos, right? Yeah, these are New York. That's Fifth Avenue, that's 23rd Street, Fifth Avenue, this is Fifth Avenue and 37th Street. Uh, Stieglitz, Albert Stieglitz ran a photo gallery in New York on Fifth Avenue. I think it was 297 Fifth Avenue, something like that. Um, called the Little Galleries of Photo Secession. And he showed modern art for the first time in the United States. He showed Duchamp's new Descending a Staircase at the um, Armory Show in 1913, I think. And sort of blew people's minds. People were freaked out by it. Um, and he also was a big proponent of straight photography, which is what comes after pictorialism or modern photography. So here we have this pictorialism See the style, the sort of softness to things? What's different here? Sharper. Much sharper, absolutely. And what about the content of the images? What are we looking at? Before we were looking at snow, sort of people posing. And here, we're looking at, what's on the right? A car. A car, absolutely. It's a car wheel in somebody's hand. On it. Actually, he was married to the painter Georgia O'Keeffe, if anybody knows that. Um, if you don't, look her up. Uh, and on the left is a famous picture called The Steerage, where he's um, looking down into um, what's really sort of coach, <laughs> coach seating on, uh, or economy seating on a boat. Um, and what he's doing is documenting technology in a, in a tight, technical way, right? We're going from sort of hazy views of nature to tight views of um, modern things. Um, Paul Strand, and by the way, the dates down here, people, are not their dates of their lives, but the dates of the majority of their practice, right? This is when they were photographed. So Paul Strand photographed most between the 1910s and the 50s. Um, looking at things, uh, not only a very modern sensibility, but also bringing us towards abstraction in photography. If you look on the right side there, what are we looking at? A chair. What is it? The whole chair? Are we seeing the whole thing? No, we're seeing just a very small portion of this sort of rail and the repetition of rail. Paul Strand, very interested in patterns and repetition. Patterns and repetition are very interesting photographically. Okay? So whenever you see a pattern or multiple things together, take a picture of it. it is strangely appealing to viewers, patterns, repetition. It engages something in our mind that we can talk about. Um, so modernism. Modernism, very much about the ideas of being true to the medium. Um, what is the innate nature of photography? It's about rendering things crisply. It's about having this sort of long range. Um, and modernism also is an idealistic um, place to work from. Meaning, people who are modernist artists believe that their art is going to change the world for the better. And Ansel Adams took these photographs in the West. He might be the only person who actually really made a change. But his own was too. Um, uh, yeah, this is an amazing picture, isn't it? This is the Grand Tetons and the Snake River. Uh, this is not what it looks like, by the way. He manipulated this intensely in the darkroom. He came up with a whole system of manipulation in the darkroom called the zone system. Ways to sort of render clouds darker and intense and lighten the trees here. 
this is strangely bright, right? So, and this is sort of dark, but it's bright over here. And he's sort of brought up this tree. So much work went into making this print. It's just as fake as Bayard pretending to be drowned, or um, the cannonballs being hauled out of um, the crevice by. Um, or Brady's people moving bodies around. This was shot on the roof of his van in a parking lot. Right? But what he did was he took this picture and said, here's untraveled nature, we need to preserve this. And he worked with the Sierra Club and brought these pictures to Congress and they set up a bunch of national parks based on, and expanded other national parks based on really the effect of Ansel Adams photograph. Early Photoshop, we'll do that in the dark room. Burning and dodging, burning and dodging, filters. So in this idea of being true to the medium, Walker Evans is a photographer who stands out as being very influential and being very um, amazing in his practice, really. Walker Evans was hired by the United States government during the 1930s to go around in the South documenting Rural poverty and American fortitude. Um, and he went around and did that. He went into, he got into people's houses that were desperately poor and took pictures of, of their homes, which were surprisingly clean and well kept, or you know, this sort of like this whole sort of like propaganda purpose behind these pictures of making people feel like they can make it through the Great Depression. Um, and so in this picture you see a woman on the side in a rocking chair, and here's her home. Um, what's her home built out of? Looks like cardboard and ads, mostly, right? Or here's um, the drain board of uh, this kitchen, I think, where you have the silverware of a whole family right here. You know, they have, uh, looks like three forks, a knife, and three spoons. Um, so people in very desperate streets, by the way, this work was paid for by the federal government, the Farm Security Administration in the 1930s, and it is available for any of us to use in any way that we want um, on the Library of Congress website. Dorothea Lang, another great photographer going around in the 1930s documenting uh, poverty. This picture, which I think was 35, 36, um, it's an image of a woman who, Dorothea Lang was driving across the west and she saw a car on the side of the road and walked up and took picture, 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 and we actually have the contact sheet of her um, previous images to this. Um, this is a family who had just sold the wheels off their car for food in like Oklahoma, trying to get to California. Um, so tough stuff, but you know, really sort of amazing. Amazing. It wouldn't be the same in our memory without the picture, right? Um, so back in Europe, about the same time, we have this guy, August Sonder. August Sonder, very much looking at that portraiture Brady or Nadar, and thinks to himself, this is Germany between the wars, right? Now between World War I and World War II. Um, in Germany, it was, a, it was a flourishing place at that point. Uh, very diverse, very intellectually, um, it was an intellectual center of the world. And Sonder decided that he was going to categorize, he was going to um, take pictures of every person, every type of person in Germany. And so, Here's a uh, pastry chef, here's a bricklayer, and that's what he titled it. He went around taking pictures of the people in their place of, of work or of life, in a way. Um, and so here's uh, three blind schoolgirls, a furniture varnisher, three country gentlemen, uh, circus performers, two peasant twins. Let's take a, a close look at this. This is a very influential picture. Very influential picture. Um, a young soldier, which gives me shivers. Right, this is 1928, 29, um, before the rise of the Nazis, who did not like Saunders' work. Right, they said, no, 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 Germany is not diverse. Get out of here. Get all your work out of here. He escaped actually with his work. Not him. I don't know what happened to him. I mean, the funny thing is, right, hide the insignias. What does he look like? Yeah, farm boy from Iowa. This picture 
of the peasant twins, take you another look at. I just want you to remember it. And I'll show you some of the stuff that reflected in a second. Okay, August Sonder, cataloging, going out and finding that inner truth, but outside, in bringing the camera now to people. Right? And cameras at this point have gotten to be about this size, and they do have a click on them. Click, click, click. So he was going around, maybe with a tripod, taking pictures of people wherever they were. Um, film was around. He was able to sort of take multiple pictures before he went back to his dark. In the 1940s, the Germans kick out Sonder, but they also invent 35 millimeter film. And the handheld camera. Henri Cartier-Bresson takes this camera, goes out on the street, and starts taking pictures, stop motion on the street, which couldn't have been done before this time. And Cartier-Bresson coins the term the decisive moment. The decisive moment is that moment when a camera captures a split second that describes everything before and after, succinctly and beautifully and well organized. And what's happening in this picture? Right here. The guy's jumping into a puddle, right? He has a reflection right there. What's going to happen to that reflection uh, you know, a tenth or a hundredth of a second later? Right? That splash, the ripples are going to go out, and the reflection is going to be gone. So what we're looking at here is this beautiful moment of time, right before the heel strikes the water, with this sort of beautiful leap he has coming off this ladder. Look back here, there's the ballet dancers sort of leaping in these posters with these curves. There's this other guy sort of back there reflecting, creating this very dynamic um, composition. Stunning. You know, it's, it's one of these moments where um, you kind of can't believe it once you start taking pictures how good a picture it is. Um, Cardi Versant, going around on the street, just finding pictures on the street. He invented street photography. And in the United States, my favorite photographer, Helen Levitt, New Yorker, shooting basically from 1930 to 1990. She died four years ago at like age 97 or something. Um, she was a successful commercial photographer. She saw Cartier Brisson's work and said, man, I want to do that. I want to go out on the street and take pictures. And so she did. She walked around New York City taking pictures. Um, of people in, in different ways. She would not only take pictures of people like this, right? She'd go up and be like, oh, picture. She'd also use tricky methods to be um, surreptitious. Um, one thing she used was um, a little mirror at the back of her camera so she could stand like this and take a picture facing that. With the camera, you know, she'd be standing like this and looking that way, but taking a picture that way, right? And that's how she got that picture of those gangsters on the stoop. Um, so Helen Levin, going around the streets of New York, really very interested in children and play, has a very good sense of humor, but very directly influenced by Cartier Brisson. See the similarity in this picture? Very French, right? He has two bottles of wine, he looks very proud. Very American, she has two bottles of milk and is walking by a very pregnant teenager back right there. Wow, who does not look at me. Um, but that adds like this sense of humor, right? Um, moving on in time, another huge influence in photography is this guy, Robert Frank. Robert Frank, a Swiss, what do you call somebody from Swiss to a Swiss to um, driving around the country um, in the 1950s. 1950s, he's still alive, by the way, he's still working. The 1950s, uh, in popular portrayal, was sock cops and, I don't know, guys wearing t shirts with cigarette packs rolled up and driving around cars with big fins. And, you know, sort of post war um, ambulance is what was portrayed popularly. Robert Frank, the Swiss guy, comes around the United States and sees desolation. He sees a very cold place that's um, devoid of a lot of warmth. I don't know, I'm still repeating myself. 
but that's really what he's talking about. And very segregated. And he goes around documenting that in the 50s, which honestly brought about um, a lot of um, sort of attention um, in negative ways. Everybody hated, hated Frank's work in the United States in the 50s because it was so contrasting against what people were thinking of themselves. Um, the last modernist photographer I'm showing you is this guy, Sebastio Salgado, who worked with the UN as an accountant and went around these really troubled places, Brazil, gold mines in Brazil, or um, famine in, I think this is Eritrea. Um, and making these beautiful pictures of these horrible situations. Right? And we've all seen pictures of malnourished kids in color of clothes with flies in their eyes and they'll be you know what I'm talking about? Like that, like, and it's, it's so intensely painful to look at, you can't look for long, right? You're just like, oh, man, that's terrible, what am I doing? Salgado's idea is that you entice the viewer to keep staring at this horror and they'll attach themselves to emotion, emotionally and, you know, respond to it in better ways. So here we have this sort of very beautiful portrayal of people that are starving. Or here we have this very beautiful portrayal of people that are working in this, you know, really inhumane situation in the gold mines in Brazil. Um, Salgado's argument is I engage people in, in a longer way by making it beautiful and it's a better yeah? Um, oh, better. All right. Um, uh, people are against this thing, they're just taking advantage. Um, but he really thought he was um, making a difference. Okay. Postmodern. So remember those twins? Arbus, D.N. Arbus is a New Yorker in the 1960s. New Yorker. Um, in the 1960s, um, she discovered August Sommer's work, actually. Rediscovered it. Brought it to the United States. Heavily influenced by it. Except she wasn't going around categorizing everybody in New York. Her idea was to explore her innermost fears. And her innermost fears were fears of being sort of uh, sidelined by society and culture, or just being totally bland and one of the sort of uh, many in, in society. And she goes around documenting people uh, in very intimate ways, uh, talking to them, sort of uh, betting out, uh, uh, tickling out their inner weirdness. Um, Gary Winograd, had contemporary of Arbus, going around uh, doing street photography, in an obsessive way, so documenting, interested in, in crowds, and movement, and, um, and, and incessantly going around and finding crowds, basically. And there were a lot of interesting crowds um, in no, New York, but Dallas, um, or LA, uh, in the 60s and 70s. Lee Freelander is the third photographer, actually, of uh, Arbus and Winograd to have been included in this uh, show at the Museum of Modern Art in 1972 called New Forms. Um, Friedlander takes this idea of like beautiful composition that those like modernists and uh, victorialists were using and says, forget composition. I'm going to put lines right down the middle of my picture and talk about sort of how society is so schizophrenic and you know, modernism is so lost. So you make these compositions where these typically vertical uh, elements and stuff on one side contrasting with the other. Right? Here's that vertical element. Um, here's people walking around. Here's people or slouching guy in the slouching uh, place. Uh, I'm going to skip more Rosler. Uh, uh, Cindy Sherman is maybe the preeminent postmodern photographer. And in fact, right now, opening, oh, it opened. Opening last weekend is a retrospective of Cindy Sherman's work at the Museum of Modern Art that I recommend everybody go to. Uh, she did self-portraits. She took pictures of herself in the 70s, famously, as um, what she called untitled film stills, which is sort of a generic character in a non-movie. Um, and she's continued to do self-portraiture. The idea of postmodernism as opposed to modernism, um, one of the other difference is modernism, people are going out into the world and discovering things and pointing things out. Postmodernism, people are coming back in to 
their homes and talking about themselves and their own quirks and weirdnesses. Samaras, every picture of his is a self-portrait. Sally Mann, uh, most famous for her pictures of her family in, in her backyard. Um, in the 80s, Sally Mann was one of the last people to get federal funding directly as an artist. And because of her work and a couple others, uh, a bunch of senators freaked out. Um, they called her work child pornography, right? She had naked pictures of her kids or news. Um, and does anybody remember Jesse Helms? The greatest guy from North Carolina. Um, freaked out and, and, and defunded the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, you're talking about sort of collaging people together. Paul Smith is doing that in Photoshop now, very interestingly. Talking about uh, either football culture in England or war. Um, these are all him fighting himself in his Love Me Hate Me series or his um, Robbie Williams series. Uh, and today, in this very postmodern aesthetic, um, we have a few photographers that sort of stand out. This guy, Gregory Crudson taking the aesthetics of cinema and using that as a way of making photographs. So he's really talking about sort of suburban dystopia in his images. Um, but what he does is he gets a town's permission to shut down Main Street, hires a crew of movie lighters, gets a guy to operate the camera, and has a whole movie set basically just for a single photograph. And I'll show you a video of him working at some point. But, um, these images, and also he's hiring actors and actresses now to be in his photographs. But his images have always sort of just escaped understanding. You're always wondering what is going on. Um, and I think the reason why he's hiring actors and actresses now is to make a, that expression that, that is inscrutable and, and keep it on their face while he takes a picture with a thousand people around. It's actually hard to do. To pose in front of the camera. We're going to talk about what it feels like to be in front of the camera too. Um, uh, we don't talk about the locks. Uh, I'm going to talk about Renegade Easter right now, and that's going to be there. Renegade Easter is my favorite photographer. She does portraits um, of people in moments of transition in their lives. So here we have the transition from childhood to adulthood. She was going around the world taking pictures of preteens on beaches, which is a very vulnerable place for a kid, right? They don't have a lot of clothing on. Yet, they are very self-confident in a way that they, you know, sort of makes them seem not vulnerable, right? Uh, the way she photographs these kids is, is interesting. Um, she does all her photographs. Horizon line shows us the height of the camera. Horizon line is the line at which our eye or our camera is located. So where is her camera located in relation to her subjects? Yeah, mid thigh or lower. So she's taking pictures like this, and she's getting down close to the ground, for, uh, visually raising up her subjects on to a pedestal and saying, you know, notice this, look up to this situation. Uh, here's a work, actually. There's more of that done. Um, of the transition of this um, refugee from Romania to the Netherlands, which is where Renegade Nature is, um, every two years. And this last picture is like, honestly from 1997, so there's more. Um, and what I'm going to stop with today is this series of images that she did of women who had just given birth in clinics in the Netherlands, holding their freshly hatched children. I don't know what to call it. It just came out. I need to talk about babies that just came out. Um, so here are women in a very transitional time. Right? She's talking about moments of change. What's a bigger change than that? What's a, and, and also, she's talking about strength and vulnerability, right? With the tweens and these women, very vulnerable. I mean, they're new. They you know, probably can't run if they needed to. But they look very strong, right? In that same moment. That, that difference there. Very interesting. Um, we can't see the horizon here, but you can tell because we're looking up at their elbows. Mm -hmm. So once again, she has the camera low and is looking up at these people. Okay. Um, so that's nothing.
nothing in the history of photography. It's a slight sample from here and there. Throughout the semester, we're going to look at these photographers more in depth and other photographers. Okay. Uh, what do you do for the next class, people? Um, email. email me. And, uh, and paper if you can get it. Start looking for a shoebox, find cameras. Bring objects, exactly. Bring objects that are translucent that you can fit in your pocket. Okay? See you next class. Yeah. I made it. Look at that.